If you'd like to earn CPE credit for listening to this episode, visit earmarkcpe.com. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. Continuing education has never been so easy. And now, on to the episode. Hello, and welcome to Oh My Fraud, a true crime podcast where our criminals are going to burn in hell, but a minimum security country club type of hell. I'm Greg Kite. And I'm Caleb Newquist. Caleb, uh, before we get into it, uh, yeah. I, I'd love to read a listener review real quick. Uh, this is a fun one. It comes from a listener named Claytonius. Claytonius says, I love this effing show and wrote it F apostrophe ing. I love that, Claytonius. Uh, the, the quote continues, I watch it for the cursing, but as an accountant, the topics interest me, albeit mildly. Best <laughs> podcast on earth for swear enthusiasts like myself, which I, I didn't know that was a genre of podcast, but I love that he uh, categorized us where he did. Yeah. And he gave us five stars. He did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice that he did that. Um, Although he was basically saying the fraud cases are kind of meh, but but these but the swearing is meh, just the, chef's kiss, you know exactly, exactly. Love uh, it. Yep. Anyway, so if you like oh my fraud for the fraud or the swearing or both, take a minute to write us a review or rate the show. Yeah, uh, it will help more swear enthusiasts. Yeah, on the show it will. It will. And, uh, you know, we love reading reviews on the podcast, too. So if you write one, there's a not a not a not a small chance that we'll get to yours and put it yeah. on the show. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Do your do your worst or best, whatever, you know, whatever you take that to mean. And uh, we'll yeah. probably get it read. Yeah. 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 <laughs> one other thing before we get into today's episode, we are for hire. If you or your organization needs a fun and engaging and relevant presentation you're in luck because we do fun and engaging and relevant live presentations yeah maybe your company wants to host a webinar but doesn't want it to suck we do that maybe your conference needs a keynote we do that too and don't worry if you're not a swear enthusiast right we can clean it up uh, because we're adults yeah and professionals exactly uh if you're interested send us an email at oh my fraud at earmarkcpe.com uh, and we will let you know about our pricing and availability. Uh, but Caleb, changing subjects, today's episode, we had the privilege of interviewing Kelly Paxton. Uh, Kelly is a former special agent with U.S. Customs, and she hosts her own fraud podcast called Fraudish. Kelly's had a fascinating career and is pretty unique compared to our two other fraud investigator interviews, Chris Marquet, episode 42, and Tracy Conan episode 22 all three of them have been fraud investigators but all three have had very different careers which has been really interesting to hear about uh but rather than continue talking about it why don't you just listen to it and here is our interview with kelly paxton all right we are here with kelly paxton uh so excited to have you on the podcast Finally, I guess to uh, full disclosure, we tried to interview you once before. My computer caught on fire, and uh, so did my hair, and that's why I'm bald and have a new computer now. Uh, but Kelly, welcome back, I guess back, to the uh, Oh My Fraud podcast. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I was like, should I reach out to him and say I really want to do it again because I had so much fun. So it all right worked out. Oh, you, you had you had while, while my life was just disintegrating. You were like, "This is this is a great time. Let's do it again." Awesome. Yeah, Greg was Greg was likely beating himself up. Uh, yeah, uh, it was. <laughs> there's a lot of self loathing going was, on. It was over there. Al Although the one thing I do remember is every time I was able to rejoin the interview, I would try my hardest to like ask a question that. I hoped made it seem like I was still around the whole time. And Caleb informed me that uh, I I was not, that that was no. not the case. The universe, and, the universe had other plans. It, it, for me. Yeah. The universe that hates me. But, but anyways, Kelly, <laughs> uh, like I said, welcome back to the podcast. Um, you, you are also, you're a fellow podcaster a, a, and not only that, a fellow fa fraud podcaster. Um, yes. And we'd love to hear, and, and an accountant, tell us kind of your origin story. 
where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? How did you find accounting? How did you find fraud? How did why did you decide to spend a ridiculous amount of your free time uh, investing into something like a podcast? Tell us all that stuff. Okay, so I'm not an accountant. I just oh. play one. No. Okay. So I my dad made me take one accounting class in college. When I told him I wanted to major in international studies, he's like, you have to take an accounting class. I actually liked it. I I kind of followed my dad into the family business. I was commodities trader and then stockbroker and bond trader. And long story short, um, we got a client when I was working at kind of a boutique uh, investment firm named Alan Taylor. Now, this is all public information, so I'm not sharing any secrets. Okay. And I was answering the phones one day and a special agent from U.S. Customs is like, hey, I'm calling from U.S. Customs and we're trying to track down Alan Taylor. And I was like 27, 28 at the time. And I kind of giggled. I was like, oh, is that what we're calling Alan today? Because he'd come into the brokerage firm and most clients really didn't come in. And he had all sorts of stories and he drove nice cars. And this was back before Know Your Customer. So we were not doing anything illegal. We just figured that Alan probably, maybe I'm in Oregon, grew some pot. Okay. And okay. Um, so we, uh, you know, the broker tells Alan, hey, someone's sniffing around. So he immediately pulls his money. And uh, fast forward, my husband's going to go get his PhD at University of Washington. Shout out to Seattle, Caleb. And um, I called the U.S. Customs agent and I said, I knew Alan was dirty and I got a job at U.S. Customs being a special agent. Oh, that was that was it. You're just like, I knew it. And they were like, we need you. And that was <laughs> that was the well, hiring process. It was they had this thing called Schedule A. And if you had certain backgrounds, you could kind of skip through the system a bit. And the special agent in charge really liked my background. And it's a funny story. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever interviewed for like a government position. It is very regimented. And everyone gets asked the same questions because you've got to be fair. Well, the special agent in charge decides he wants to sit into my panel interview. And the recruiter is like, oh, God. And then he's like, I've got a question. And like, you can't do that. So he asked me this question. Well, I answered it right to him. And, you know, I got through the process. But the woman who is in charge who got me hired, she goes, you know, if you had duffed that question, and he said, you're out, you could have like complained. And I was like, I'm not a government employee. I didn't know there was like pamphlet. So it was kind of, it just worked. It right. really just worked. He liked my financial background. And so I did a lot of money laundering cases. Okay. Did you, enjoy, did you enjoy working for US Customs? Oh my God. I, I got paid to play. I got to chase oh. cars. I got to do surveillance. <sighs> I got to look in people's bank records. That was Christmas. When I got bank records, that was Christmas. I would Wait, sit on so the floor. Can I just stop for a second? Yeah. You said you said surveillance. Like, did, were you doing stakeouts? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, wow. We were on wiretaps and oh yeah. Nice. Oh man. So like you were you were you were in a windowless van with a bunch of equipment on the inside and like listening to people and it's like. Well, I did that. Drinking, ba drinking bad coffee. <laughs> yeah, I did that. But then also, you put two women in a Honda Accord. And no one's going to think anything's weird about it. You put That's two true. men in a Ford Focus and they're like, cops. Like, <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> That's true. cool. That's true. So it, it, right. it was just a blast. Two, two, was, dudes, like, two dudes is like, this is something fishy. Two ladies is like, girls night, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Like, like, truly. Like, you know, throw a baby seat in the back. And they're like, That's like, she doesn't have a gun. No way. <laughs> no way she's packing. Oh, no way. But but also you were packing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's just part of the job. So you were like, hey, I knew that guy was was dirty and they they just tossed you a gun yeah. and said, well, Here's your here's a Honda Accord you know, and here's your partner. You, you know how to handle one of these. <laughs> so I had never touched a gun until I went to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. We were not a gun family, like not at all. And I actually really liked shooting. It was a lot of fun and I, mm -hmm. I'm good at it. Like, right. nice. you know, um, so it was fun. I'm not a gun guy. I didn't grow up a gun guy, but I live in Utah. So state law requires me to have five scattered throughout my home. It's uh, just where I live. So one of the, one, 
one of the one of the things that happens in a red state. I guess you guys wouldn't know about that. Actually, Colorado Colorado is uh, is one of those weird places where it uh, there's a lot of how do I put this delicately? Weirdos. Uh, I'll say it. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. There's a lot of so yeah. If you want to see if there's there's lots of loony lefties here, but everyone's armed to the teeth. It's yeah. a very strange. <laughs> nice. It's a very strange place. Nice. Well armed snowflakes. Yes, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So okay, so you're at the U.S. Customs Department, but then well, and I guess that's the whole. Fr- that's all you're doing. Money laundering. You're investigating fraud. That's where the love of fraud came from. Yeah. Yeah. So I arrested bad guys. Your typical bad guys, drug dealers, money launderers, pedophiles. And then my husband finishes his PhD, gets a job in Wisconsin with no border. And, you know, customs is all about the borders. Yeah. Hmm. I'm pregnant with our second kid. I'm like, okay, I'm going to stay home. I stayed home for three years and almost lost my mind. (laughs) Um, So then I started to do background investigations for the Office of Personnel Management and Homeland Security. And then my husband gets a job back in Oregon and I go to work at a local sheriff's office and I get my CFE, my certified fraud examiner license, and I become their fraud analyst. So I go from arresting bad guys to doing backgrounds and the background investigations are really fun. Like I love doing them. You drive oh, all over the state. You're knocking on doors. You're chit chatting with people. Um, so come home to Oregon, go to the sheriff's office and I start working embezzlement cases. All my suspects are women, except for one man. Really? And I say he stole like a woman. And there are differences between men and women. Like, I, I mean, I don't know why this is controversial. Men and women are just different. We are. Um, so women steal less. Women kind of steal for a sort of family reason. They don't steal to buy a Lambo. They steal to upgrade <laughs> to a Camry from a Corolla. Um. <laughs> So I Googled the term women embezzlers and I come across Kathleen Daly and her paper in 1989 that has the term pink collar crime. Oh, okay. And so it is all about position, not gender. 90% of bookkeepers in this country, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, are women. Hmm. So it's just women have access and we underestimate women. Like, we just do. It's like, oh, she's not smart enough to steal from me. She's going to rob you blind. Is that, Do you think that's 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 legit, the, the mindset? Oh, yeah. Well, that's gross. Yeah, so, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. For, for sure. Um, I, you know, from the cases that we look at all the time, um, two of the things that, that, uh, that lend to someone turning into a criminal – uh, is is trust and being really good at what you do. Like we're we're surprised how many times we really look into a a particular person who committed a fraud, and their their backstory is they were amazing at their job. They were just the and so and and obviously being amazing at your job is one of the things that earns you trust. But but you can also be amazing at what you do, and people are just like I don't freaking trust that person at all. <laughs> um, do you feel? Do you do you feel like those? I guess in my mind, I'm starting to connect some dots and go. I could see where, uh, you know, you've got you've got women who are amazing at what they do. I mean, sort of the opposite of what you just said because I I I work with uh, I have worked and do work with lots of women who are often, or should I even say, usually better than me at what <laughs> at what at what I do. And also, I th- I would say. I guess it's more speaking to my therapists that I've had over the years, uh, it's a lot easier to trust uh, for me to trust women than it is to trust men. Do you think? How, how do you think gender falls into the the competency and the and the uh, and the trustability kind of factors? So I'm also known as the fraud hashtag queen, and it okay. came it was very organic back when Twitter was Twitter and we liked it. Um, <laughs> I wanted to keep track of the stories that I was posting. So I started hashtagging pink color crime and then trust, but verify. And then it's position, not gender. Um, the, I get Google alerts on every night before I go to bed. And I have only had one victim tell me he did not trust the woman who stole from him. They all like the woman. 
They had them in their home. They considered them family sometimes. And then the guy was like, I never trusted her. So I didn't give her access to my checking account. And I was like, yeah, but you gave her access to your Visa card machine. And she stole $450,000. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So they like them. And it's like, you know, we just, we're socialized. Like when you, okay, Caleb or Greg, when you were little, mm -hmm. did your parents or kids, you're at the mall. If you get lost and you see a bad guy, run, scream and run, find the nice lady. She'll help you. I, I don't I don't remember my mom specifically coaching me to, to find the nice lady, but I it also I think I would naturally have done that anyways. That yeah, the 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 ladies seem safe and seem nice. Yeah. So yeah. Even if they're wearing pink. Yeah, but maybe especially if they're wearing pink. <laughs> so yeah, we have this like, you know, I don't want to normalize embezzlement. But like, we need people to talk about it when they've been ripped mm -hmm. off. Yeah. I have this whole thing, like a long time ago, when there was a sexual abuse case, they would put the victim on the stand and say, what were you wearing? Oh, yeah. Like they were blaming it on her. Right. Another one of my hashtags is no victim shaming. It, if we make victims feel bad that they got ripped off, they won't go to law enforcement. And they say only 15% of the embezzlement cases go to law enforcement. People mm. are embarrassed. And when master of the universe, barbarian at the gate, has to tell his guys, friends at the private golf club, oh yeah, Gladys stole a million dollars from me. He's embarrassed. They're like, dude, how stupid can you be? No, we can't do that. Gladys is smart. Like she just is. And you just don't pay attention to her. Yeah, we do. You, are you are you aware that we uh, very much like to uh, relish in victim blaming on our podcast? That's, yes, I am. I yeah, am. Okay. I know. You know but, what? Wait. Yeah. Oh, you know who I victim shame? All victim shame them all day long is all the Theranos investors. I okay. I victim shame those people all day long. Will I okay. victim shame <laughs> the plumbing company owner? No, I will not. Okay, because I I I think for us it's more. Um, because we we we're always talking about internal controls that could have been better, and and yeah. really, if you follow internal control, that's really victim blaming right there. Victim blaming and victim shaming is it's like you. I mean, kind of like you know, I didn't trust her, so I didn't give her my my checking account, and it's like, but you did give her access to your your visa machine, so it's kind of the same thing where it's like, I, I think part of our education side of what we're doing is is very much saying there are things you can do to try to minimize being a victim. And I think we just uh, prefer to categorize that as we're not attacking blaming. people, but we're not attacking people. We're so, attacking uh, internal sometimes, controls. Sometimes right? we're attacking the people. There's times. So, I have this surprise and delight. And look okay. at the pink color. This is um, Pat Bruder from uh, Idaho Private Investigators Association gave it to me after I did a presentation. I was at a party last night and there's a guy, he's a master of the universe, you know, very successful. He finds out what I do and he's like, so I could see how they could steal on like the incoming money side, but how do they steal on the outgoing side? And I'm like, do you have vendors? You pay rent, you mm -hmm. pay. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, surprise and delight. So if you only look at checks over 5,000, pull one for 500. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, vendors, like, you know, call them up, see when they were started, stuff like that. So I don't want a victim shame, but I also tell people, it's like, these people are smart. Yeah. Like I had a, I had a friend whose husband was very successful. They're both very successful. Now an ex-husband. And when he met me, he said, I'll never have to hire you. And I'm like, oh, why is that? And he's like, look at me. You're at my beach million dollar house. I'm very successful. Um, and look at me. I'm scary. No one's going to steal from me. Guess who got ripped off? Yeah. Nice. Pride yeah. comes before the fall. There you go. You've got it. I I have actually look at this bracelet I have over here. Oh, I misplaced it. It says pride. If I had my bracelet, it says pride comes before the fall. I don't know where somebody moved it or something. So, well, I let's, so how'd you get started podcasting about fraud? So, um, 
I went as a member of the National Speakers Association and I went to their annual conference called Influence and I saw a guy talk about podcasts. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. So I came home and my virtual assistant's like, you need to make money. Podcasts don't make you money. Like it's gonna take a while. It's still taking a while. Um, so then COVID happened and I'm like, I'm stuck inside. I'm gonna, I was on Great Women in Compliance and one day I'm out running and I'm kind of like, I'm going to do great women in fraud. So it first started out as great women in fraud. And once in a while, I'd have great dudes in fraud. Greg, you were on the podcast. Um, but then last <laughs> summer, I rebranded to fraudish because I didn't, I want, I want the whole universe of people to, and not to self-select. So um, I love my podcast. It's like a passion project. I just got an email today from a guy who just said, I just found your podcast. I loved it. He wants to get into the field and yeah. So awesome. I have fraud professionals. I have fraud victims. I have fraudsters. There you go. Cool. That's fantastic. So the other thing we really, that, that I'm really excited about because, because you, you prepped us on this already is I want to, as a, as a fellow fraud podcaster, I, I have a handful of my favorite frauds that we've ever covered on the podcast. And I asked you if you had, if you had some favorite frauds. And and one of the, one of the two that you brought up, and this I, we, I likely we're going to spend the whole rest of the time just talking about this, is the the case of Lori Eisenberg, who's from uh, Idaho, who was. It, please tell us everything about the Lori Eisenberg fraud, which also I guess to even prep prep everyone, Caleb, were you able to, to look over this fraud before we got here nope. today? Awesome. Nope. This is one because we we always talk about how we're you know we're we're a true crime podcast, but but uh, there's not really murder with. With ours it's more our, our people are still evil but don't actually hack bodies and and I, I guess the teaser is this one's got both uh both white collar and just a brutal murder in it as well which makes it so wonderful yeah so this is technically a red collar crime okay I just but define red too I've never heard of red collar crime. Does that mean there's blood Ooh. involved? Involved? Oh, you guys gotta get Frank Perry on your on your podcast. <laughs> okay. He has a book. I mean, huge book. I'd pull it out, but then you'd see my bottom half, and you don't need to. Um, <laughs> called red collar crime, and he actually coined the term with um, Rich Brody, red collar crime, when a financial crime turns deadly. Oh, okay. He's a Ooh. lawyer and a CPA. He's fantastic. He is my highest downloaded podcast on fraudish. Nice. Um, he's great. So yeah, when a financial crime turns deadly, it becomes red collar crime. So there's a whole rainbow of crimes. Um, <laughs> right. Pink collar crime. Yeah, white there's gray collar crime. crime. There's yep, yep. Gr so, wait, great great collar. Is that is that like elder? Uh, yeah. Well, not, maybe not elder uh, fraud, but when the elders commit the fraud. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, a whole rainbow of fraud. Yeah. <laughs> so Lori Eisenberg, um, and there's like, I don't know if you want to put it in the show notes, there's a dateline about her. There's um, a podcast, oh gosh, I'm forgetting, a Snapped Women Who Murder. That's a thing. They've got lots of episodes. And okay. I was going through the Wikipedia episodes. A lot of them are tied to money. You know, I hate to say it. I don't want to say money is the root of all evil. Do you guys think money's the root of all evil? Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, Caleb, it's the root of a lot of evil. I will, I'll definitely concede that, but I don't, yeah. I think, I think oh, I could find yeah. some evil that was, uh, that was, uh, that, that the, uh, the motivation was not necessarily money. Yeah. I'd say I, 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 that's, that's well said, Greg. I don't know if it's all, but. But also, it, you're it you're talking to two lot. accountants who are like all. We're we're really leaning into the all side of things, <laughs> like one hundred percent with. The, so with, I like to say that money is the root of very many bad decisions. Okay, yeah, I'm on. I'm a hundred percent on board there. Yeah, yeah. So Lori Eisenberg made a lot of really bad decisions. So, um, and I was listening to Snapped, a uh, woman who murder. And I remember when this story came out, like it was, it's not very old. It happened in 2018, but she had been stealing for three years. So she gets, you know, we, the gig yeah. is up. 
Yeah, and 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 again, thinking back to like some stats from the ACFE, uh, you know, the media. It seems like the median length for frauds is somewhere around a year and a half. So she was she wasn't she wasn't one of the ridiculously long fraudsters, but she was definitely on the on the higher end of yeah. of of length for fraud. Yeah, yeah. So um, she lives in Coeur d'Alene, uh, also known as the Panhandle of Idaho, mm -hmm. and. Um, she is the executive director of a nonprofit. Now, like when I was at this party last night, this guy's like, so do you maybe want to join our nonprofit? And the first thing I said is, do you have DNO insurance? Because I won't join a nonprofit without it. What's DNO insurance? Directors and officers. Okay. And it's so specifically. Sued, they, okay. They're going to protect you. Okay, gotcha. So it's not because I know that there's insurance that you can take out to make sure, like if for employee embezzlement insurance, basically yeah, is what it is. Like fidelity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but this is different. DNO insurance is different. Yeah, like you know, all big companies have it for their boards. Okay. Um, you, you wouldn't join it. So she's running. She's an executive director of a nonprofit that provides housing for low income people. Okay. And um, she starts stealing. And as you guys know, they don't steal one check for $750,000. It's like, it's little and it starts hockey sticking. Yeah. Yep. So um, she knows the gig is up. And she decides in February to take her husband out on the boat. It's cold in Idaho, northern Idaho in February. <laughs> um, and there's a 911 call. And she says, my husband, I think he's had a stroke. He's fallen off the boat. I can't help, help. And, you know, you hear the whole 911 call. And um, was it convincing? That, I mean, <laughs> in I hindsight, know. maybe not. Yeah, in hindsight, maybe not. So okay. um, she uh, that morning, the story drops in the paper that she's bust or, you know, she's under investigation for stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And gee, her husband never found out because he fell, fell off the boat. Well, long story short, his body eventually gets recovered. And he has an obscene amount of Benadryl in his system. For those, you know, for those February allergies. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, February allergies. Yeah, um, it's rough. It's rough. I mean, really, with everything blooming in Coeur d'Alene in February. In February, you can really get a stuffy nose. <laughs> so, you know, crazy long story. Um, she uses her daughters to steal. She uses her husband to name to steal. Um, she becomes a fugitive for four months. Okay. And you know, this is a oh. woman who uh, I'm not going to say looks like me, but like is my demographic. She's older, but my demographic. She's not poor. She's not uber rich, um, but she likes the lifestyle. And apparently her husband was very frugal. Oh, okay. Like, there's a whole like story of him that he wanted a motorcycle and he was never going to go in debt. He would only pay cash. Well, their lifestyle required a lot more cash than he thought. Okay. So okay. in the numbers that they say she embezzled, it's anywhere from like 500 to 1,000 to like 2.5 million. The numbers are kind of crazy. Yeah. So um, she is in prison 30 years, um, parole only after 30, and that'd be, she'd be like 95. And then she gets another five years for financial crimes. So she's not getting out of prison. Right. But she took an Alfred plea and she said... Um, you know, an Alfred plea is such that if you were to go to trial, maybe they'd find you guilty. So I'm just going to take an Alfred plea. She said she was going to drink the Kool-Aid and he accidentally grabbed it instead. So she was going to commit suicide on the boat. Okay. So she had, so she had like, uh, like, like legit cool. Like she had put, did he drink something with, with, yeah, yeah. He, the, with oh, the Benadryl? Yeah, he drank okay. It. So, so yeah. she's saying she's saying that she like made a Benadryl a a, a lethal dose Benadryl cocktail, and she yeah. was gonna she was gonna chug it because she was afraid her husband was gonna find out about her stealing yeah the money and but instead she's she's uh 
she's back unmooring the boat and he's like mm, i'm thirsty this looks tasty and he chugs the benadryl the the benadryl and uh mountain dew i'm assuming that's yeah that's uh because that's really what pairs best with benadryl i don't know if you guys <laughs> know that um yeah so that that was her story that was her story um now and I think I, I think I heard that like she fell asleep and he drank it while she was asleep. Well, it's like okay, who's gonna fall asleep on a boat in Cordel Lake Cordelaine or Cordelaine Lake when it's probably twenty degrees out? Like, right. Well, no. and who's who's gonna be able to take a nap when you're about to take your own life? I would think your adrenaline would probably kick in a little bit if that's your plan. I, I mean, well, it, mine would. I'd have a hard time resting if I'm going. Today is the last day. I'm fine. <laughs> It's finally over, but you know yeah. what? I'm gonna catch. I'm gonna catch some shut eye this, before this... <laughs> I really catch some shut eye. <laughs> right, right. Well, and um, the funny, not funny. Um, so they had been to Florida, and he called his doctor after Florida because he's like, I just was one day I was dizzy and I couldn't. I, something was wrong with me, so he like made a doctor's appointment. Well, you know, <laughs> we love forensics, especially when it comes to digital. She yeah. had like Googled, you know, how to, what did I put down? She Googled like, um, you know, how to kill someone using Benadryl or something like oh. that. Like her, her digital trail was not good for her. <laughs> oh, right. Let's just say it wasn't <laughs> right. good for her. So how, anyone out there, How to kill my husband whose last name is Eisenberg using Benadryl or some other similar substance. That's yeah. A, yeah. So that's, she that's failed. Hard. It's kind of a red flag. She kind of failed the first time. Yeah, it, like they alluded to the fact that she tried it once and it didn't work. Yeah, did and they wait? Were were they? Was it the same idea? Did she take him out on a boat and try I to think, give him? Oh, yeah, yeah, really? Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. And, so she was getting desperate. Okay, so so in terms of the murder, which which I'm I'm very interested. <laughs> what do you like? Do you think she was just trying? Because I didn't, I, I mean, I don't know enough about Benadryl, Can, I, but I assume any anything that's like a, a higher classification than vitamin C, I assume you can overdose on it. Is that is that kind of, was that kind of the idea with Benadryls? You take enough and they get so, because I, I do take Benadryls sometimes just to fall asleep at night. Um, and, and from what I understand, it's, you know, diphenhydramine is what Benadryl is. And that's a, like the main ingredient in most uh, over the counter sleep aids. Um, so I assume with a sleeping pill, you take too much, you sleep forever. Is that so? So you think that was the plan, or was the plan to make Fall him sleepy enough boat. to to hip check him into the into the water? And the you, boat, it, it, the water is so cold, he wouldn't have lasted. Okay. Like so, you he, think the whole the whole thing was I'll get you sleepy, and then I'll that'll make it you drown faster. Yeah, probably. I mean, okay. I I don't have a murderer's mentality, right? So, um, but you know, you get really woozy, and then he could just fall off the boat. And then I did hear a cop say, like, the the time you spend in that water in February, it, you're gonna, and you can't swim because you're all woozy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It and won't take. Probably, it won't take long. Yeah. Yeah. He probably yeah, yeah. didn't have on a life jacket either. She probably right. was like, "Oh, honey, let me tighten that for you," and rips it off of him. Or I don't. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, do you and then with the Alfred's plea, one of my uh, understandings of that is that the motivation for someone to to use that plea is to to avoid going to court. So there's so everything that so you're never actually charged with the crime. So there's at least you can you know, you can maybe still gaslight people into thinking that you're a good person. Is that and, and and a lot of the details are never going to come out because it never went to court. Is that is that correct with Alfred's plea? Yeah, the Alfred plea is such that yeah, like you think you do it because you think a jury will find you guilty and you don't have to go through it. Now they okay. had kids. He had kids. They had kids. Um, and she also her daughters did get probation because apparently it was shown that you know they knew the money wasn't legitimate, so they only okay. got probation. But I mean, if you're going to, you've killed your husband and everyone, you know, with the podcast starts off with like, I just guess I never knew my neighbor. Like they had a very loving relationship. It was their second marriage. Um, you know, people didn't, didn't expect it. That's why like my world changed when I went from arresting bad guys to having, you know, nice women who look like me 
who I'd go out to tea or happy hour with, and they're getting arrested for stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have an idea of what criminals look like, and they don't look like us. Right. Which is weird because I do. That was one thing. J- just from my brief read of one article that she sent over, I do remember that in there that that, that these I, I get I, somehow they had a re- reputation of these guys have been married for I, I don't know what it was ten fifteen years something like that like seventeen and, I think yeah and, and it's like and they're still in love like the day they said I do that was kind of the impression I got from the article. Um, I ju- just I mean this is just gossip at this point. But do you do you think? Was she just a sociopath and maybe, I mean, what do you, was she faking all that? Do you think that that part was real? Do you think that, she, yeah, because I, I don't know how, and, and again, if you're if you're that good of an actor to make the whole community think you guys are just madly in love and then you hip check your husband into the icy cold Coeur d'Alene River or wherever they were, um, you know, that's obviously... I guess not the case. What, what, how do you, how does your brain reconcile all that stuff? Or okay, does it? So I used to do background investigations for the feds. Yeah. It is a look in time. That's it. And then, you know, feds get re backgrounded every five years. Life changes. So between year, you know, you get your background done and then I don't know, your spouse leaves you, you, find another boyfriend, girlfriend, like life changes. It doesn't stay the same. Hmm. And like, you know, we hope it doesn't veer off too much, but she didn't steal. We are unaware of if she stole, I don't know where she worked before, but Hmm. like, you know, do I think Bernie Madoff at age five said, I'm going to run the biggest Ponzi ever. (laughs) I don't think he did. What? (laughs) I think stuff happens and then people just stay on that road. Yeah. Other people come back. Which makes me sad. Now that you say that, I really wish that I had prepped my daughter on career day to say (laughs) I would like to eventually run a Ponzi scheme that will eclipse Bertie Madoff. So I I feel like I I missed an opportunity as a parent. But but regardless, go on. I'm sorry. I interrupted. No, no, no. So, you know, things happen. People change. You know, good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you just don't stay in your lane forever. Yeah. Um. Did she steal before? I don't know. Okay. Now, I do have a thing anecdotally in embezzlement. If they steal within six months of starting a job, they stole at the place before. <laughs> okay. That's just yeah. anecdotal. Yeah. No, that, yeah. that I, I would, I'd, I'd be on board with that. That, that. that feels like a good hunch. Yeah. 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 I had someone when I say I worked at the shoe company and, you know, she stole. And I said to the detective who I used to work at, you know, that sheriff's office. And I said, she stole before he goes, she's clean. And I was like, dude, she might look clean, but look at her work history and look where she worked. They don't have a good tone at the top. And he's Mm -hmm. like, she's clean. And then of course I go on to my statistics of only 15% of embezzlement cases get turned into law enforcement. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, "Mm," you know, so, um, if someone steals straight away, they've done it before. Right. But but she had been at this. But you're you're saying it's that's that's up for. It's hard to say because she had been a, the director of this nonprofit for much longer than the three years that she was stealing. Is that yeah? That I'm not where you're exactly. Going? I'm not exactly sure how long she had been there. Yeah. But like, yeah. So uh, she was 67, I think, when this happened. That's the other thing. Like, kind of gray collar crime. We expect when you hit 60 plus something, you. Sh- you retire, you live on social security, you got your hopefully a 401k that's healthy or God forbid a pension. And you know what they say, cause I'm in that age range. You've got the go, go years, you got the slow go years and you got the no go. Okay. And so people think they retire and their expenses are going to go way down. But I mean, I've got a lot of friends and their expenses are not way down. They're like, we're traveling cause we can, yeah. we're moving. And you know, they had, I think 15 grandchildren that's 15 birthdays a year. You got to go have <laughs> presents for them. And like, yeah. you think life gets cheaper. Oh, you don't have to drive to work. You don't have to have work clothes. Well, you got to go to the Dolomites. You got to go, you know, take a river cruise. Um, uh, it's keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. 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 So I think she liked the nicer lifestyle. And I think he was, 
I think he was oblivious to what they were spending. I mean, I used to joke, okay. my husband has since passed, but I used to joke that I could steal from my husband all day long. He would have never known. He didn't look at the books. Like he just didn't. Some people just don't. Right. And yes, you can victim shame my husband, but I never did steal. So good, good, good. <laughs> Um, what, how did, do you know how she perpetrated that? Cause, cause again, it's so easy. We did, uh, the one, one of the red collar, I'll, I'll use my new vocabulary. One of the what red collar crimes we looked into was the, of the singer, Selena, who her, yes. her business manager had been stealing from her, um, and then eventually murdered her. Uh, so it's so easy to get caught, you know, to get caught up in the murder side of stuff. But, but back to the fraud, do you know how, how did she perpetrate the fraud? Cause you said she stole the, again, probably cause it never went to court. They never landed on a dollar amount. Um, but I know that you, you know, we've talked about that. We, we had one case where, uh, they, they, they charged her with stealing half a million dollars, but the statute of limitations went back you know, like seven years. And it's, and, and it kind of like what you're saying, it's like, she, there's no way she wasn't stealing long before the statute of limitations so um so Do you know the two to six rule i don't okay so this is again anecdotally but i'll give a very good example of it okay. um whenever someone you ask someone you know so how much have you stolen and they'll confess unless they're serial grifters and um whatever number they give you multiply it between two and six now, when okay. and Rita Crunwell is a perfect example. What oh. did she tell the FBI she stole? Ten million, fifty-three point seven, two to mm. six. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like me going to Nordstrom's and my husband's like, "What were those fine Italian leather boots cost?" Oh, hundred bucks, and they're five hundred. Uh, like you know, we round down. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think, and this is my theory with that. I think that legitimately, especially for someone who's who's stealing money over a long period of time, and it's like you said, it's smaller amounts that add up. And I don't think that. I mean, unless you've got. I mean, I guess we we know of some, and I and maybe Rita Crundwell was like this, but because uh, I think didn't didn't they say they found like a bunch of spreadsheets that where she yeah. was actually keeping track of what she stole. So she probably knew, but a lot of people, I think they, they legit don't know. They just steal it and spend it. And they're not really keeping track of how much they've had. And so they really do think that they stole a lot less than that. Cause they're like, if I stole a million dollars, I'd be living a lot higher, you know, <laughs> higher on the hog than this. And it's like, no, actually, you know, a million dollars over seven years is going to, you know, not get you weekly trips to Vegas. So yeah. 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 It's like getting a raise. When you yeah. get a raise, they say put it all into your retirement. Right. No, you just like yeah. I joke the suave shampoo becomes a beta, right. and you, right. you're like, oh, I like that better. You yeah. know, I mean, yep. it's just it's lifestyle creep. Yeah, for sure. So, so what did she do to actually get this? Uh, you know, between half a million and two and a half million dollars out of the the nonprofit. So she did fake accounts. Okay. And she also signed checks. So she just falsified checks. So now this is an interesting thing from the ACFE report to the nations, which we can talk about because it is a survey, not a study. And there is a difference. Right. Um, men are more likely to commit vendor fraud than women, but okay. you have to think about the position. More men are in like purchasing procurement than women. Okay. And that's their, you know, the opportunity is for them. Um, so, but she did fake accounts and she also signed checks. Okay. So she funneled money into an account that wasn't the business, uh, the nonprofits account. And she yeah. just wrote checks to people that she wasn't supposed to be writing checks to, which, and is that where the daughters came in? Is it, was it the yeah. daughters who were receiving some of those checks? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Now, yeah. another part of the story. Okay. So, and again, not to poo poo that, but also it's, I don't know. I guess I guess the interesting part of this fraud is the murder and the Benadryl. <laughs> the way that she stole the money is kind of like, oh, okay, we've seen that before. That's nothing nothing particularly inventive or, or uh, you know, eye popping with that, R right? Or is there? Would you concur? Yeah, I mean, I I have seen people who, when they confess, you just see the relief. Oh, like, okay. The gig is up. Yeah. Like you just see the relief. They're like, they all know that they're going to get caught eventually. And that's why a lot of them keep track of it. 
Like I've gone into people's desks and seen like EOB checks, like those are the ones they stole. Or I've seen people that literally have had a spreadsheet of stolen amounts because they think they're going to pay it back. Like, right. And right, right. this is gambling. I hate gambling. Just it's, it's my line in the sand. Um, so say that Gladys has a gambling habit and she's stealing money and all of a sudden she wins Powerball or whatever it is. Like she wins big. Yeah. You guys are the accountants. So she pays it back and she puts a journal entry in for $1,500,000. Do you not think the owner of the business is going to say, <laughs> hey, what's that $1.5 million? Right, right, right. Oh, well, I stole it from you. Do you think the owner of the business is going to say, ah, you're okay. No, no harm, no foul. <laughs> Keep going, Gladys. Yeah. I like right. you clicked on the Gladys. I like it. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, well, and I, that's just the, I mean, the whole, I'll pay this back. That's, that's a very diluted rationalization for fraud of, of, of how you're going to make yourself feel like you're not a worthless piece of trash for having stolen money from, from your, your business. But it's also just right there. I, you know, at, at my, we, we haven't gotten into it cause we still don't know if we can, but, um, a, a fraud that was not reported to the authorities was, was, uh, one of the people who used to work at the company that I still work for. Um, and that was, that was a, it was a, it was a loan type fraud where all the money that was taken out of the company was like, Oh, it's a loan. And it's like, well, there was never any documentation for this loan. <laughs> My favorite kind of loan. Never, right never a cent repaid of of interest or principal on this loan that had no documentation. But it was always like, oh yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a loan. Businesses give loans to the to their you know top people all the time. I was no going to say, let me guess, that was like a C suite person. B basically, yeah, yeah, yep. So, yeah. So, and yeah, anyways, so, so, but, but again, just to say that's, that's really almost, that's a very explicit, I'm going to pay all this money back kind of fraud where it was like, no, 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 that I'm not stealing that money. That's a loan. And then the, 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 once it was discovered, everybody who was like on the board of directors and felt like it was their, you know, they were, they were somehow culpable for this guy uh stealing the money that victim victim blaming themselves as victims they were they were like oh, i guess it is a loan so we'll have to hold on to that and you know and and hope that he can actually pay it off so yeah well, we're, that, weird that's a really interesting point that you have about that because okay say that business goes to law enforcement mm -hmm. which Just, they did not okay well say they did mm -hmm. and law enforcement is gonna Oftentimes, we'll say that's a civil matter. Go get yourself an attorney. Oh, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's it, like they're going to say that's an uh, that's a civil matter. We got dead bodies all over the place. We don't, you know. Right. It, it, unfortunately, you know the saying: if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have had someone recently come out, and they're so frustrated with law enforcement because law enforcement is like, we, we just we don't have the resources for this. Like, sorry but we don't have it. And you know, if there's not a dead body and in Lori Eisenberg's case, there was a dead body. Right. So, you know, there's podcasts about her, there's all sorts of things, but like, you know, your average garden variety embezzlement. I got in trouble when I worked at the sheriff's office because I wanted press releases for these embezzlement cases. We were getting really good sentences for these embezzlement cases. And I was banned from saying press release. I'm not oh. very much. Um, <laughs> and and the reason like I you, did like there was, was a quarter jar every time you said press release, you had to put a quarter in a jar. Practically, wow. Like so, guess what I did? I you, went around. Okay, you still made the press releases, or you started your podcast? No, oh. I went to. So the public information officer was like, "No one wants to hear about these embezzlements, Kelly." We want to like do the stories about the kid who crashes into Carl's Jr. at two in the morning. And I, and you know, this is 2008, 2009 when newspapers, mm -hmm. people still read like okay. papers. Uh -huh. And I was like, dude, no one reads the paper who crashes into Carl's Jr. People read the paper that have businesses and they see that Gladys stole a million dollars from Dr. E. And then the bigger thing for me was the Google effect. So you have Gladys Smith stole a million dollars from dr e and that follows her forever 
right, if it's right, a press right. release. So guess what I did? I went to the news. That there was a quarterly newsletter. And, you know, it was for all the, like, you know, crime fighters in the, you know, you sign up for your sheriff's newsletter. And I had them put them in there. It didn't, I didn't last much longer at the sheriff's office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they, they were on to you pretty quick and were like, hey, yeah. this is okay. I guess. Yeah, let me ask you, Kelly, let me ask you a question since you mentioned sentences. One thing that I'm consistently perplexed by, and I know Greg is too, is just how sentences are determined. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like, do you have any experience with that? And like, what kind of light can you shed on? Like, what determines what kind of a sentence people get? Like, we're familiar with wire fraud. Like, wire fraud is a good example of where we know it's like, it's, it's maximum 20 years for each kind of wire fraud. So like wire fraud at, at the federal level, it, it really adds up. But I'm, I'm curious, like what, what, what your, what, what insight you have into like how sentences work. Okay. So, um, I tell this, I, I have a very weird sense of humor when it comes to fraud. And, um, if anyone out in the, your audience is going to steal, let's do some pre due diligence as to sentencing in your municipality. Fantastic now, idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is a judge in Montana who he got in a little bit of trouble because he said, women do this crime all the time. We've got to throw the book at them. Mm. Um, not great. No. Uh, so, Sounds like he would have been very comfortable at the Salem witch trials, but <laughs> yes, whatever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the feds are different because they have, um, they've got, uh, a number system. So if you steal 500 to a million, you get points. If you okay. steal a million to, so that's pretty buckled up, but like a municipality. So Portland was in a tri-county. So it says Portland, but there's Washington, Multnomah and Clackamas. And the kind of joke was don't steal in Clackamas. Cause you're going to, they're going to throw the book at you steal in Multnomah County, which is downtown Portland. You get Zudu. Like you'd have to do community service and scrape up zoo poo, <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, I, um, I, I like that. I like that yeah. joke. I like yeah. that joke. I'm sorry. I'm and, not sorry to say. In Washington County, we were getting good sentences. So okay. we had, but you know, this is a, it's a, it can be subjective. So we had a young woman named Tiffany who stole. Now she didn't have a record, but she clearly had done it before. So um, she has an agreement with the prosecutor and, you know, uh, her defense attorney that she'll probably get 19 to 23 months. And she decides she's going to let the judge sentence her. And so being on the good prosecution side, we bring in her ex-husband and her ex-husband says who they share custody with, you know what? I try to teach my son right and wrong. You have to pay for things, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes to my ex-wife's house on the weekend. He drops his iPhone in the pool and she just buys him a new one. And he's, I'm really struggling with this. And he's going on and on. And you can see the judge get more and more angry. Now, so the end, the judge is like, I think it was uh, 76 months. Okay. Now she had an agreement between 19 and 23 and she decided to roll the dice so to speak, he gave her 76 months. Now she appealed it and I don't remember exactly what happened, but like it's all over the board in these sort of smaller municipalities. Mm. And the judge had a child who is a long, crazy story, but he, you know, he had some issues on how she was parenting and he threw the book at her. Mm. She could have gotten 19 months. Right. So Very, yeah. So the ju so judges have a lot of so at the federal level if I understand you right. There's there's basically uh, you hear about sentencing guidelines and judges are kind of duty bound to follow those for the most yes. part. Whereas in state court or district court, you know, local courts, the judge has a lot more discretion. Yes. Hmm, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you not not a not a great <laughs> Not, not a, not a great answer. It's still like, oh, it's, it's, a it's kind of a mystery. It's a gamble, yeah. Greg. It's a mystery. Um, yeah, it's a gamble. Yeah. Either way you go, federal case or <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and case. then people are like, what's? How is it different between a federal and a municipal case? Mm -hmm. You know, right. that's a whole oh, exactly. other. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, I don't like the Michael Avenatti case. 
You know, he's in prison. Yep. Okay. Greg, you know who that guy is? Oh, yeah. Michael Avenatti. He's the, the guy who's in prison. Yeah. <laughs> Stormy Daniels. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Nike really pushed the thumb of justice, let's just say. And he's in federal prison. Okay. Now, yeah. if you're Joe the plumber and Michael Avenatti tries to shake you down, do you think the feds are going to be interested in you? No. All right. The justice but he tried to shake. Gonna... But he tried to shake Nike down. Yes, he did. And Nike's got a lot of lawyers. They got a lot of lawyers. Yeah, they do. And they've yeah. got the U.S. attorney on speed dial. Yeah. 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 Um, one last thing before we wrap this up. I thought, I, 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 back to the case, I thought one of the, and mostly just me saying this is something that I thought was a, a weird twist in the case, was didn't, so back to Lori Eisenberg, uh, she did, didn't one of her daughters post bail for her and then she skipped out on the bail that her daughter posted so her daughter was like i'm gonna do you a solid mom here's some money to get you out of jail because i believe in you and then mom was like thanks for that and then and then blipped out and like like you said she was on the lamb for a while um yeah four months and and, and then the there was something about and may, again I, I i i just vaguely remember this when i read through like didn't the daughter that daughter or maybe there was a number of daughters who who specifically came to her sentencing not in support of her, but actively to be like, yeah, put her away. So, something like that. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So he had daughters from a prior marriage, and I think those were the ones who were like, eh, oh, okay. You know? I mean, yeah. So they had a blended well, that, family. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, can you imagine? Like, wait, you know, wait, was it the daughters? Was it his daughters that posted bail for her? That would I'm be great. Okay, because yeah, that would be I nuts if it's like we believe in our that our that our stepmom is is a good person yeah Yeah. i think i think he qualifies as step monster yeah i think so too yeah Yeah. for sure not bonus mom not step mom she's step monster yeah 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 for sure (laughs) well kelly uh the 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 name of your podcast is fraudish i'm assuming that people can find it wherever they find uh podcasts is that correct yes they can yeah yeah perfect so so for our our true crime white collar red collar gray collar crime uh in junkies out there uh you got another one to put to put on your list with uh with kelly thank you so much uh for being on thank our show you. I, i'm so glad we were able to do this again because i listen to your podcast religiously and um you know we're all a community of trying to help people you know not yep. get be victims exactly right on well thank you so much for being here we appreciate it a ton Awesome. Okay, Greg, that was fun. I'm glad you joined us for this episode. <laughs> Thank. It was nice. It was nice to be here for the whole time and not have to bounce out and wonder what I was missing before yeah. I I came back in. So yeah, fun, fun time with with Kelly. Uh, it's it's she she's got it, she has she's developed her her own ver, vernacular for for yes. everything everything fraud related and it's very fun to uh to 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 get to get educated on the the latest slang in the fraud that the fraud yeah, i'm gonna be googling using. i'm gonna be googling red color crime from now on uh, are you good hey, that's yeah. probably not a bad idea those are the fun cases for sure yeah. i'm also going to need to google uh when do i know that i've been uh, OD'd, w- roofied with Benadryl. I think that's what it needs to, <laughs> to be. So, Woo. yeah, because uh, they're yeah, that's a uh, that. Well, also, d- my my uh, my fiance, she loves uh, the true crime po- where people do get murdered. Oh, okay. Uh, is your is your wife into that? The the true crime? No, genre? not really. Oh. Unless there unless there's like a unless there's like a a a, 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 a religious sect involved. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, no this this was one of those ones where I was like you you're going to love the uh, this Lori Eisenberg case because not only did she steal money and I told her about the 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 boat and the Benadryl and oh, man. and then I can't remember what but she's like, "Oh my gosh, that reminds me of" and then she told me this other true crime story that she'd heard about that was like so disturbing and like 10 <laughs> times and I'm just like, "That's why I like what we do because <laughs> I, I hate that there's an actual human being who did what you just told me they did. Let me just hear about ste- people stealing money and going to jail. That's what that's that's my speed. That's my lane. <sighs> if you'd like to contact Kelly, she's on LinkedIn at Kelly Paxton, pink collar crime expert. 
or you can go to either of her websites, kellypaxton.com or pinkcolorcrime.com. And she just released a book called Embezzlement, How to Detect, Prevent, and Investigate Pink Collar Crime. Get it wherever you get. Well, I think it's on Amazon. I don't think you can get it everywhere. Yeah. But anyway, so, try getting it wherever there, you is get there books. Another, is there another place to get a book? Barnes & Noble, Greg. <laughs> Barnes & Noble. I, I, I can't. I can't remember the last time I bought a book that wasn't just on Amazon. So, uh, yeah, you're not, Jeff, you're not wrong. Jeff, Jeff, I'm in the palm of Jeff Bezos's hand. He just, he, the, he just smiled as soon as I said what I said. And I, uh, I made him, uh, even li- more. Evil. I think, I think you make him a little bit of money every time you smile, Greg. I, oh, do, oh, do I? Okay. Then I don't know how this, but I'm just, I'm this, this one's for you, Jeff. <laughs> Uh, all right, that's it for this episode. Remember, Benadryl is a great over-the-counter antihistamine and murder weapon. And also remember, according to Idaho state law, if your daughter posts bail for you and you skip out on your court date, you are required to return any world's best mom mugs that you were given on Mother's Day. Uh, it's a state law, uh, so just be, be aware when you're traveling through Idaho. Yeah. Uh, if you want to drop us a line, send us an email at ohmyfraud at earmarkcpe.com. Caleb, where can people find you out there in the ether? LinkedIn slash Caleb Newquist. Greg, what about you? Are you on LinkedIn the internet? slash Greg Kite. Okay. Actually, it might be Greg Kite CPA, but I think, I think it's, it's just Greg Kite. Is it Greg Kite? Kite? I'm pretty sure it's just Greg Kite. Yep. <sighs> Oh, My Fraud is written by Greg Kite and myself, our producer, Zach Frank. Rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you listen to podcasts on the Earmark app, you can earn CPE. It is that time of year, is it not, Greg? It get is. CPE if you're it an is that time of year. Yes. Go get it. Yeah. Earmark. CPE. Worth it. Join us next time for more average swindlers and scams from stories that will make you say, Oh, My Fraud. Oh, my fraud.